So this is, uh, this is a paper by Nancy Sherman of Georgetown University. And uh, just a, a note before we start with Nancy's paper, those of you who are speakers or commentators at the conference should be congregating at the Estancia Hotel at 6.30 uh, and in the lobby of the hotel being ready to be picked up where cars show up and draw people off and pick them up in the main part of the hotel. At, what's that? We have the cars organized already. That's all set. Uh, Dick, if you want to stop by on your way to, uh, you're welcome to. And that's all. And if you have any questions for me at the end of the conference, any practical questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it falls upon me as the uh, last speaker, and thank you for holding, holding on. So <laughs> uh, it's been quite a remarkable uh, conference. But I want to um, thank Sam and have you join in uh, in thanking him. Um, it, he's been a remarkable organizer from uh, corralling us, whatever it was, 18 months ago. <laughs> and putting us up in a the finest resort I've been in a long time in a conference, um, near an ocean with a hot pool and hot tub and all of that jazz. Uh, would that we had more time to play in all, all of the <laughs> amenities. Um, and it is incongruous, given our subject. You're right, Victor. Uh, and so I am um, the odd person out to some degree, because I, I work on moral psychology of soldiering. I'm looking at war within, you might say, uh, in the interior moral space uh, of soldiers' psyches. And um, the, the conversations have really sharpened for me uh, a lot of what I hear. I should also say that I, uh, there aren't going to be any hypothetical examples. There are concrete examples b based on narratives, soldiers actually uh, talking to me. And, it's, um, and I bring a little bit of the clinical side. I wouldn't say I'm doing public education the way Larry did, but just so you know where I'm coming from, um, I have been working a lot with folks, the clini clinical side at Walter Reed, at Bethesda, now they're the same Walter Reed, Bethesda Naval. Um, and I've sat on the suicide review board of the, um, of the vice chief of the army. So, uh, and I work with the veterans community a lot in my university. So it's pretty close uh, to home. And uh, the commitment is sort of uh, ongoing and palpable. Um, I work with soldiers. Um, okay, with 2.4 million uh, U.S. soldiers returning from this, this decade of war and, and many others from allied nations, how soldiers can thrive after war is a, a subject of urgent public interest. And we've, we're pretty good these days, I think, um, at, from what I've seen remarkable, actually, in dealing with uh, prosthetics, um, uh, facial reconstruction, TBI to some degree, traumatic brain injury, and some diagnosis of post-traumatic stress. But I think what's been under-emphasized are the moral dimensions of the psychological injuries. And uh, I take it the injuries are moral for, amongst other things, they are about how individuals hold themselves responsible for their, for their conduct and activities in war. And I'm thinking of this as I say, the handout is just the, my background thoughts. Uh, I won't be touching on things specifically. Um, I think of this in terms of reactive attitudes of, of self-directed and other-directed guilt and shame and resentment um, that are very uh, biting ways of uh, holding self and others accountable for real and apparent commissive and omissive wronging and being wronged. And, falling short of role, role duties and role ideals. So now in general normative uh, discussions, philosophers have tended to study negative reactive attitudes. Uh, and by and large, with a few exceptions, more positive ones have been understudied. Um, and those few who have explored them tend to think about, uh, well, of late, Adrian Martin, hope in others, uh, Mar Margaret Walker as well, or trust. Um, and self-empathy, which is a peculiar breed, and I don't do much work, I apologize for that, in this paper on thinking of how a whole uh, 
the whole web of positive and negative, self-directed and other directed reactive attitudes holds together and what analysis would hold best. But anyway, self-empathy, I think, is um, can be a very positive way of addressing oneself um, and, in some sense, um, beginning the process of moral repair. Um, so I want to begin with um, two stories of shame, um, one contemporary, one ancient. Um, move to talk a little bit about guilt and how shame sometimes masks guilt. Uh, talk about recalcitrant emotions and why I think discussions of recalcitrant emotions and irrational emotions short shrift some of the phenomena I'm interested in, and then um, move to self-empathy. Okay, so um, a case. Uh, Army major, and I, I give names by permission, and I think it's important to, if, to recognize uh, individuals who are happy to um, have their names um, mentioned. Army Major Jeffrey Hall deployed to Iraq twice. He commanded infantry artillery units at the time at the rank of captain near Baghdad and Fallujah. He signed up at 17 and um, at 40 he was uh, deep in counterinsurgency operations in his last deployment. Deployments essentially acting as mayor, supplying shoes, doing medical assistance, um, risking life often to bring food and medical care to families in needs. This is not what he signed up for. It's actually, this caused deep dissonance. He really, to this day, believes that he, as a soldier, is trained to engage and destroy the enemy. Um, and specifically, in, car in carrying out coin, he was, um, he felt deeply betrayed by his command, by their incompetence and by character. Um, and that as a turn, in turn, he was forced to betray those who uh, he had an obligation to help. Uh, stateside, he was diagnosed with severe post-traumatic stress. Um, and he said to me and to others, you have to understand my PTS, many in the community dropped the D because of the, the stigmatizing sense of comes with disorder, had everything to do with moral injury. It wasn't from killing or seeing bodies severed or blown up. It was from betrayal, from moral betrayal. And in talking about moral injury, he's actually picking up on it. The term has now been used by the VA, and there's some research being done by the VA on trying to come up with clinical methods that both recognize that the extinction of fear and conditioned fear that's part of post-traumatic stress, life threats against life, may be very different from treating uh, guilt and shame and um, other kinds of uh, moral phenomena and moral suffering. So one incident particularly stands out. Um, so he's in, uh, he's in uh, Baghdad's Mansour district. Um, he, uh, a family driving home from church, crosses a cordon and gets caught in crossfire of a, a US uh, attack on a high value target. Hall's unit doesn't carry out the attack, but he is at the scene at the time. And he witnesses a mother and child evacuated from a car who then shortly died after. And the father was instantly killed and pulverized on the, on the road. And he essentially picked up the pieces. Um, and he says to me, it was collateral damage that happens probably justified in war. Car turned a corner, wrong time, uh, wrong place. But he says, in, essentially says in his mind what followed was, was not at all justified or unavoidable. And that's the aftermath that unravels him. So after the accident, his, his uh, commander at battalion headquarters uh, asked him to find the surviving family and give solace, make solace payment, and do what they need to have done to them to to uh, mitigate the collateral killings. And uh, he finds a father, excuse me, he finds an uncle and a young daughter. Who, um, and over Chai, the family made it clear that what they wanted most was the return of the bodies for a prompt burial. So Hall sets out to work. And if you remember Paul Bremer's CPA, the Coalition Provisional Assembly, uh, an agency, it was a none too competent organization. and. Um, 
Hall falls in the middle of this incompetence while trying to carry out his orders. He needs official papers from the Iraqi Ministry of Health and so begins a, a sort of a tragedy of errors. In the meantime, Hall gets a call from, the, from uh, the commander to say the CPA actually has solace money for the family, come and get it, he gets the money, it's a piddling $750, not much in those days, um, and uh, gives it, says to his commander, without quite um, disobeying orders, says, you give it to them. Commander says, nope, your job. So he, he uh, sucks up and, and carries on. He gives it to the family and the uncle essentially throws the envelope on the floor. So this guy feels stripped of everything he can do well in war. Um, he, doesn't, he can't do this by weapons. He doesn't have a command structure that's trustworthy. He doesn't have a bureaucracy the Americans put in place that's helping him out. So he's pretty hanging on his own there. And he thinks it's sort of finally over, and then it goes on one more bit. The family's being somewhat accommodating, says, well, at least give us birth, give us the, 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 the bodies arrive, they're, they're, they're almost uh, indiscernible because of being, of rotting in the heat. They ask, can you, can you get us proper death certificates? So he has to go through the whole rigmarole again. And when he gets the death certificates, the Ministry of Health has stamped on them in big, huge red letters, enemy. This was the last straw and those are, the birth, those are the death certificates that Major Hall has to deliver to the family. So the story you know, verges on the, the comedic, um, but the, what I want to get at is this sense, utter sense of helplessness and a sense of betrayal that, that, that he feels. And when he says the injury is more long-lasting than seeing the detritus of war for three years, I, I think what he means is that the the, the betrayal um, by his command and by the uh, organizations that support the command um, put him in a feeling, uh, put him in a position of really being trapped, um, powerless, captive, much more captive than he felt he had been often uh, when facing enemy fire. Um, and so another case uh, that actually contemporaneously came up at the same time, I heard Hall's story while watching Ajax. Um, by the Theater of War, a group that has gone around the country and elsewhere performing. And so if you remember, Ajax uh, gets stripped of his teammate, his, uh, his honor, his status, when he isn't given the, uh, the award for being the best warrior. Odysseus, who's the best speechifier, but not the best act war warrior, gets it instead. And in a peak of blade, a peak of um, of rage, uh, oh, Ajax um, wants to ultimately show his mettle as a swordsman, and he goes after his uh, his fellow Athenian troops, and he goes after uh, Odysseus in particular. But Athena blinds him, and he ends up killing barnyard animals in a what we call a dissociative state. Um, and as Sophocles puts it, he, you know, he gives him ironic distance as he sees this, uh, this bloodbath that he wakes up in, he, Ajax. Look at the valiant man, the brave heart, the one who unflinchingly faced the enemy. You see the great deeds I have done to harmless beasts. Oh, the ridicule runs against me. So there's, a, there's distance, but couldn't be more unforgiving. And this is an unparalleled moment in Greek tragedy. Ajax falls on his sword, on his own sword. And this was shown to audiences. Um, I saw it um, at an armed forces um, health protection conference um, because of this, uh, the um, unprecedented uh, spike in suicide rates amongst American troops. So. The, the experience of shame suggests um, of um, being seen but nowhere to go. Um, and Greek etymology is a reminder, shame in Greek is eidos, and it's related to eidoia, which is genitals. And so to be ashamed is to be caught without your fig leaf. <laughs> 
And the audience can be real or imagined. Aristotle always goes for the real, but it, I think that's unnecessary. Um, eyes are upon you, figuratively. Um, that's how shame feels. And in some cases, shame can be too toxic to be consciously experienced. And so I think it's often screened as a more socially respectable and manageable feeling of guilt with the presumption of guilt's redemption acts and apology acts. And in, pa and in fact, I think some, one way to think of certain instances of epistemically ill-fitting or, or, or um, inapt or rational guilt are substitutes for shame, sort of sublimations of a sort. So this case, uh, another one, which I think Soldier describes as guilt, but there's a lot of shame that's going on. Um, this army commander loses a private, I write about this in Untold War, uh, due to an accidental blast of a turret gun. Um, on an army vehicle, on a Bradley fighting vehicle. And he's, uh, it, it's hard, hard to see how this uh, particular commander um, is legally or morally culpably negligent. Um, and and I'll, I'll give you this specific case, but he feels horrific, what I call accident guilt. Um, Jeff last night was talked about option guilt, but it could be similar. So in this case, this guy, Captain John Pryor, with the advice of all his engineers, uses a marine battery for an army's Bradley. Um, there was nothing in the manuals, but nothing said you couldn't. But when he puts, when his guy on the on the ground uh, puts the battery in the Bradley, the the current and turns the ignition on. The current jumps right from the ignition to the gun, and the gun. The gun fires, and this is sort of in front of near the green zone. And one of the guys that was standing in formation as part of his security detail is Private Joseph Mayak, who gets his face scooped out. And Pryor goes through a long legal process of um, as to whether he was negligent, and it turns out he isn't, uh, according to legal uh, the legal case. But he says, now this is about two and a half years later, he's talking to me, the aftermath of that was the guilt of the situation because I'm the one who placed the vehicles. I'm the one who set the security. Like most accidents, I'm not in jail right now. Clearly, I wasn't egregiously responsible, he qualifies. Uh, still, I deal with it, and de I dealt with it and deal with it every, every day. I essentially cost him his life. So. What Pryor feels, part of what he feels, I think, is that he should have been able to take care of his soldiers better, or what I might say is he less than perfectly fulfilled his imperfect duty of care. Um, so cast, the feeling has more shame sensibility than, than guilt. Um, he failed to fulfill the duties he set for himself of office and role. But given the context and given that a guy died um, in a friendly fire accident, the more palpable presentation of the negative wave of self-reproach is as culpable guilt for negligent omission. And I think guilt brings with it a host of repertoire, a very familiar repertoire of what you can do. Um, he wrote to the mother, the mother then sent cookies to him and started talking to him as if she were his son. Um, he told his troops that the accident wouldn't be repeated. He gave them his assurances. So there's a lot of reparation work and I'm not sure shame has the same kind of reparation work in part um, because the shame is even is much is even more I think um, self-directed and doesn't involve the transgression of, um, of the harming of another in the way that guilt does. In pointing to this um, camouflage complex uh, notion um, of this emotion, I'm not suggesting that his guilt was manipulated or contrivance, um, but it's just that guilt kind of think can ex eclipse feelings of shame. And in some ways, I think shame is more epistemically fitting, or at least it's expansive in, prob in a probably a problematic way. But at least he did fall, Pryor did fall short of an implicit image of himself as a commander who takes care of his troops. Um, and uh, the, that idea, at least, though clearly unspecified, and, and that's part of the problem, is not, as, um, is not that over-idealized. Um, needs to be further specified, but it's not particularly grandiose in the way that thinking you can avoid enemy-inflicted death is. So, you know, in this way, I think shame may be a little bit more permissive than epistemically 
uh, fitting guilt. Um, and, may, and, and some of the guilt that we're quick to say, oh, that's irrational, that's um, uh, um, self, unnecessary self-flagellation, et cetera, may um, really be better understood in some cases as shame. Still can linger too long and be destructive, but um, it, shame may be masking, guilt may be masking some of the shame. So this idea of lingering too long. So in the literature, philosophical literature, it's often thought of recalcitrance, you know, the long lag between thinking you should be, thinking that the conditions for this emotion are no longer apt and yet still feeling it. Phobic fear, for example, where you know that you don't have to get on, that you know the plane isn't as dangerous as many other things you do in your life and yet you still fear the fear. So um, Michael Bra um, Brady of Glasgow, um, I think has written interestingly about this, and he says, um, in these cases of recalcitrant emotion, there's a waste of cognitive resources. Um, recalcitrant emotions, he says, uh, involve the mobilization of cognitive resources in the service of a question that has, by the subject's own lights, already been answered. Um, you know or believe, you believe that you're not guilty, and yet you construe the situation as still, um, and evaluate it as still, um, presenting you in some ways as culpable. So, and, and Michael um, says that in these recalcitrant cases, you're wasting resources, you're taking cognitive resources away from other valuable places. But sometimes, and I suspect often in difficult cases, feeling guilt involves an open question of one's culpability. Um, one simply may not have settled the matter as to whether one is fully off the hook. There's lingering doubt and harsh self-judgment that keeps the question alive. And it's not so much that one has, this, what Brady says, an incoherent evaluative profile um, where there's a conflict of evaluation on the emotion side with a, a, a belief. Um, it's that one's genuinely uncertain, uh, not certain what to believe about one's culpability given one's causal contribution. Um, there are shadows of doubt, no flat-out conflict here. So um, this, th this was a case um, from a, a student um, who wasn't sure he should take my class because his wife said she, it may just unearth stuff he um, wasn't going to process well. But he actually, I thought well, this was a very interesting um, reflection at the end of a, end of a course. So he's in um, Iraq. Um, uh, 2001 to 2005 in the Mosul region, um, and he's 21. Uh, so you, the, the ages should not um, go unnoticed. I am constantly humbled by the age uh, and what we ask people to do at various ages. Um, as a parent of children who are beyond that age, but I sure know what they were like at that age. <laughs> Um, at 21, he was a young sergeant team leader of a group of intel analysts attached to an army cavalry squadron of, of, of 410 persons in Talifar, um, so near the Syrian border. And he's the eyes and ears of his unit, totally trusted. He's the go-to guy for knowing what alleys you can go down, where you can't go down, how tall the buildings are, um, what's a good getaway, what, where you shouldn't propose an exit strategy, et cetera. So he's the point guy. And he's spending a lot of time outside the wire. And he gets, uh, it's, it's not optional. He's got to go on R&R, &R, rest and relaxation. And he doesn't want to, but he goes. And while he's there, he learns that his unit is conducting a um, a, um, a cordon and search operation in a, in a very um, difficult section of Talifar to wipe out weapon cash. And what he doesn't know is that his buddy is going to scope, to, to sort of uh, check out the region beforehand and takes a, a particular route to see if this is gonna be a potential egress route for the, for the insurgents on the, on the next day during the raid. Um, during that drive through, his buddy and two others get killed by an IED. And Tom learns about the incident when he's poolside. Um, I imagine something like what we're, <laughs> what we're at in Cutter, and it hits him hard. He says, um, "What bothered me was that it was an area that I knew really well. It was a part of the city you had to see in order to visualize, and I could see it. 
Um, and I had this lurking suspicion that my soldiers, those are the guys he left behind in the intel unit, had never really personally been there, didn't have a grasp of all the information I felt I did. In some way, again, notice the qualifications, in some way I felt responsible for not being there to provide them with the information and also the, the very Baroque language, to provide them with the information that, that that may have potentially resulted in a different outcome. It may have saved my buddy's life, but, but it's hard for him to say. So it's rough, it's a difficult thing for me to process this. I, I don't know how to say it. I was sitting by the pool and it was absolutely devastating. So he, and he says that it reflects poorly on him. Um, those are his words, so there's definitely shame. And he doesn't fault his unit members for failing to pick up the slack. They, he doesn't think they could have, but he clearly thought he might have been able to leave some message behind. Don't go down in front of that building. He has that in mind, that maybe there's a way in which he failed to leave a tra the, rad the adequate information or intel behind. But he also thinks that he is unreasonable in thinking he's the only guy that can do the job. And, this and so he has a self-exculpating moment and he goes home, he's considering whether to re-up for enlistment and he is talking to his brother who notices something's wrong. And he's not said anything, this is sort of what you have to understand, he's not said anything to anyone for about six months about what's bugging him. And he says, because his brother picks up his mood, he says, well, God, if I'm here in, if I'm out of Iraq on a two-week period of time and things go to hell in a handbasket, what's the situation going to be, be like when I get back after um, I've been away longer? And he says, it was sort of coalescing um, in my mind that I couldn't be the person that was there all the time. I could only be one person in one spot at one time. Ultimately, I was never going to cover the whole country. I was never going to be the one-stop intel analyst for the whole army. Maybe my role was actually quite small. Now, that is an amazing um, moment of, of self-revelation um, about how I over-idealized his role was in some ways. But he doesn't, it never quite leaves him. He is always with the nag that he still might be minimally responsible for his buddy's death. And, and yet he, and, and why it's not fully recalcitrant is that he's, I think, you know, still intellectually figuring out. Yes, you know, um, Jonathan Lear said to me, that's just primary process thought. That's primitive thinking, Freudian primitive thinking. It's a repetition compulsion of a sort. But I'm not sure. I think he was really unclear about what his responsibility was, and he kept re-describing the case to sort of figure out what it was. And he said to me in the last kind of chapter on this vignette, he said, I wasn't really sure if I was like the homeowner who never got around to putting the fence around the pool and neighbor's kid drowns in my pool, or I was like the cop who was off dude, legitimately off duty. And, um, at, you know, and, and had him helpful information, but I wasn't around to be able to dispense it. And he thinks he's more like the latter, but not fully clear in his mind. Um, so I think, that, you know, these are very complicated cases these individuals are dealing with. That's part of what I'm clearly trying to say. And that the at least in the clinical community and maybe even amongst those of us who try to listen and hear, there is a sense in which you would say, get over it, move on, you're not guilty. It's, um, it's uh, at best a kind of luck guilt, that it, it's not negligence, and, um, and, or, survive, or it's survivor guilt, but you know, that's an irrational phenomenon. I'm, I'm not sure in all these cases how irrational it is, and I do think they're trying to track something that um, is, an, is an important kind of minimal responsibility that nonetheless, where they still may be um, able to exculpate themselves to some degree, but not fully. So this is sort of where self-empathy comes in. Um, so much has been written about empathy, but not a lot about self-empathy. So empathy, um, 
Even so, though much has been written on the past 20 years or so, both in psychology and in, philosophy, in moral philosophy, it's still a term of, of recent coinage. Um, clearly, Human Smith used the word sympathy to refer to what we call empathy. But the term is a Greco-German, a Greco-English word for German, ein Fühling, to, to enter into someone's feeling. Um, um, developed, coined in 1873. And then in philosophy, we know of, and there's been development of two major models. Hume on contagion, you catch someone else's emotion. Um, and uh, so how am I doing on time? I, given that we've switched things around, I'm not sure when I began. About 20 minutes. OK. And um, OK, that's fine. Adam Smith. Uh, more cognitive, imaginative, um, trading places and fancy is Smith's wonderful, wonderful term. Um, and Smith insists that the swap isn't only situational, but dispositional. You don't only stand in someone else's shoes, you try to become them in their shoes. As he says, enter as it were into his body and become in some measure the same person with him. You bring it back to what, how he would bring it or she would bring it back to her bosom. Now, so how do these models fare with regard to self-empathy? And it's in particular its role in surmounting harsh self-reproach that may be too harsh for the um, level of the culpability. One obvious worry is that the contagion model um, suggests kind of repetition of the same stuck, often intrusive feeling. And Peter Goldie, um, who died about a year ago but was a wonderful writer on the emotions, um, raise, raises general issues of um, the inbuilt biases of emotional construals. As he puts it, emotional subjects tend to confirm rather than disconfirm their evaluative construals. The feeling directed toward the uh, object of the emotion and the related perception tend to be ide fix to which reason has to cohere. The phenomenon is a familiar one. When we're afraid, we tend unknowingly to seek out features of the object of our fear that will justify the fear. So we have this inbuilt uh, epistemic tendency to build an epistemic landscape that coheres with an evaluation and a feeling. You lock yourself into a specific emotional take. And self-empathy as a contagious re-experience of emotion may just exacerbate that tendency. And so I think similar worries arise for thinking about empathy in Smith's sense of, um, of um, imagination um, and that that you have to kind of still, nonetheless, dwell on that same experience and so lock yourself into the same biased way of framing the situation and you re-traumatize. Um, but I'm thinking that the notion, that those objections may be limited um, um, in the, in the, and that self-empathy can actually um, be part of a model of emotional repair um, more than just simulate or re-experience the same construals and the same emotions. And here I think, not surprisingly, psychotherapy in the model of two-person empathy is, is useful. Um, arguably, psychotherapy of various stripes and especially psychodynamic models depend on a patient revisiting and reliving a po uh, painful emotions. But characteristically, in the context of an empathic listener, by which I mean a listener who can be compassionate, um, witnessing the pain, and then through various gentle corrections of bias, reframings, help to break the repetitions and defenses. So the therapist's empathy involves tracking a patient's emotion, uh, sometimes through her own congruent countertransferences, other times more cognitively. But it also conveys a kind of compassion, trust, rapport, non-judgmental stance, a kind of working alliance, as it's called, therapeutic alliance. And empathy in that context involves access. You get to feel what you, in many cases, what soldiers cannot feel at all. I mean, they dissociate from the traumatic events. 
but also benevolence, a kind of safe um, person with, in front of whom to view this um, painful emotion. So the stance, I think, is both protective and transformative, helping the patient safely to remember, revisit, and feel painful reactions to traumatic events, but also reconstrue them that in ways that may involve a friendlier self-judgment, less rigid notion of success or failure that help loosen the destructive feelings. And all this, I think, is very familiar. Um, less familiar is the notion of self-empathy. And I'm not saying it should replace um, other person empathy. I just think it's, it's, a, it's one tool that's been sort of ignored. Um, so one way to think about it um, is thinking about the second person model. It's a first personal stance where the paradigm is a, a more, um, is, is the second personal case. And in some case, an individual may come to self-empathy by internalizing a stance that is taken toward her by another. So she actually um, takes on a therapist's uh, um, benevolent um, view as when she learns a measure of self-empathy through the empathy of a therapist. But she may also internalize the stance she herself takes to others. Susan Bryson, who's written a very moving book about her own, um, her own horrific um, left for dead rape in, in um, outside um, uh, Grenoble, um, um, spoke of um, being able to feel self-empathy only after feeling empathy for others who've been similarly victimized in a support group. Oh my God! That's what happened to me, um, she might come to say. Um, and so similarly, veteran support groups, I think, work that way. So second person empathy, either as the receiving of someone else's empathy or the giving of empathy to another person, um, where you're the agent there and not the recipient, may prepare you for empathy toward yourself. You gain an outside perspective on yourself, either as patient or as agent that's qualitatively different from the, the guilt-ridden or shaming um, perspective you've held before and that holds you hostage. I think I'll skip the bit on Aristotle here. Um, and in this regard, I, I think, I'm thinking of self-empathy as not just um, a kind of cheap self-esteem, a narcissism or self-absorption and a, a way to inflate a downgraded self, a kind of contrived boost to a deprecated self. Um, I'm thinking of it as, a, as actually a, 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 an opportunity and a kind of um, attitude that allows a fairer self-assessment, especially in the cases I've focused on where luck and accident and power ceded to others squeeze out moral efficacy and cast doubt, as in the case of Hall, on one's own character, his ability to be a good person helping these needy citizens. I don't think self-respect gets out the idea. Um, because uh, the underlying notion here isn't that you're servile or subordinate. Um, it, it, one may have no doubt about that and yet still need a fair hearing about whether could have done's entail should have done's um, in the case of guilt feelings or about how fixed or severe the damage done to self is in the case of shame feelings. Um, and, and so I think there's it allows for this compassion, a kind of fair self-assessment. I think it's ironic. Self-empathy can be, give you ironic distance. You have a backward-looking perspective at yourself, and so there's a kind of evaluative and epistemic gap that's created that allows you distance. One now knows what one didn't know then, um, and hence you can take an evaluative stance that differs from the stance you took then. Peter Goldie um, talks about that. But I think in addition to that narratable, distanced, ironic conception and compassion and a fair hearing, um, there's also um, access. And that's part of what I want to say. There's Self-empathy allows you empathic access. Um, you can actually go back and feel without being paralyzed by the feel. The Stoics talk wonderfully about being bitten. You still have residual bite and morsis a kind of, um, it, there's still, the knife still goes in somewhat, but not, but it's surface rather than all the way in. And I think that's part of what the empathic access is that I'm talking about. You remember how it felt, it's still there in muscle memory. Um, and I think um, 
being able to access that is often important to, as a way of avoiding dissociation. And also because I don't think that the sorting out of exactly how one is implicated is um, fully resolved in many of these cases. And being alive to the circumstances, the feelings of the circumstances is a way of still working out to some degree um, the ways in which you're implicated morally. Um, all right. Um, so now, obviously, the degree of access will depend on how changed a person's psychological makeup has become. It's along a continuum. When the narrative distance is great, an individual may be able to remember only coldly and cognitively with little emotional valence. You're not much alive to the circumstances anymore. And at the extreme, you're really, you've really moved on. But I think for many, many cases, and the more I read about Holocaust, literature and the literature and speak to um, soldiers that my, my dad is very much in my mind. He died just a few years ago um, as a, having been an army medic and um, I was left to clean up his effects, so to speak, in the hospital room and his dog tags were in his pocket. Uh, my dad died at 89, he left the war at 25, a few years before I was born my dad never told me he carried his dog tags. I didn't really know. I'm not sure how I didn't know. Willful ignorance on my part, um, and willful hiding on his part. But you know, and he didn't. He 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 was a medic, you might say, you know, back and forth on the Queen Mary, um, dealing a lot of times with venereal disease <laughs> and inoculations going out um, and. Venereal disease coming in, but lots and lots and lots of amputations. And, um, you know, he felt implicated in some way in, in, in the war in ways that he couldn't quite figure out. And he needed to remind himself, not just of his army GI identity, but I think of the, of the suffering of himself and, and of those around him. So I... Um, you might say, well, okay, self-forgiveness is really what I'm after, and I have wondered um, if it's this sort of forbearing or forswearing against anger and blame that is part of, of forgiveness, and you might say self-forgiveness as well. But the, the self-empathy I'm trying to get hold of is an attitude. Um, I don't think self-forgiveness really fits well, because a lot of the cases I'm thinking about is there's not clear intentional wrongdoing. Um, to which demand forgiveness from self or others. Um, and the, a, and though the, the cases, the cases vary. And, and uh, so um, so self-forgiveness may have a place in surmounting self-reproach, irrespective of whether the reproach is deserved or not. But even if it does, self-forgiveness doesn't really expose the psychological mechanism I'm trying to get at, which is, um, Preserving empathic access. Okay, that's a very psycho, psychoanalytic idea. But the, and why is it worth preserving? And I, I hinted at this. I suspect it's because I don't believe that deep that these difficult moral conflicts, which we're all trying to puzzle about, um, how much responsibility um, individuals have when they happen to be in the luck of standing here rather than there, um, with others, aggregated or not. Um, I, I I think that these. These are what, what individuals who actually experience the, those, are in those situations, are also trying to figure out. And the empathic access allows them to be alive to um, some of the worries that aren't easily resolved. So concluding, um, I'm gonna to appeal to Stoics, who I um, am always infuriated by, but love reading nonetheless. Um, so the, the Stoic sage, unlike you and I, is more limited uh, moral progress, progressors, or as the texts say, we are fools. There's only, the, fe the uh, sage rises only as often as the phoenix, and that's not too often. Um, the, the sage is fairly distanced from the emotionally laden past self. Not a lot of access to that, and that's the whole point. Get over the access, become somewhat invulnerable. And he's come to see Partly the invulnerability is because the sage comes to see the favorable and unfavorable externals in his life, those he lost, the, the, the attachment objects and the, and the good and bad luck he endures, um, 
good and bad commanders, all that is indifference. They're externals to his virtue. They're not constitutive of happiness. They don't make a dam to happiness or its absence. Um, and so you recalibrate the externals so that you um, just see them as indifferent to your well-being. Um, and, the, and the sage doesn't really, as a result, experience full emotional vulnerability in the way that we fools do. It's not that he's apathetic. He, they stipulate that they're going to be sort of like Aristotelian mean kinds of cultivated emotions on the high end and on the low end, these minimal threshold emotions that are like starts and startles, hair standing on end, blushing, um, turning green at ship and shipwrecks when you're supposed to be a sage. They don't impugn you, but they're still kind of autonomic responses and they seem like early emotions, first emotions they're called. But the world of full throttled fear, shame, guilt, resentment, indignation, all of that, um, is gone. The sage doesn't traffic in that world and doesn't remember past episodes of his life when he did and is um, affectively disengaged from how he once experienced them. So um, those, um, those episodes have lost their emotional valence, their charge. With equanimity comes a change in phenomenological access. But if the sage loses access to who he is, he also presumably loses empathetic access to those who, with regard to their emotions, are still like what he once used to be. So the price of being a sage, and it's, I mention this because I think a lot of soldiers would like to be sages. They would like not to feel what they felt. Um, the price of being a sage is that one loses touch with what it feels like to be a fool, and that's what many of us feel like. That's a radical picture of conversion, and I think it requires a dissociation from the past as part of an embrace of an enlightened future, and I wouldn't recommend it. Interestingly, Sophocles' Ajax also finds no rapprochement with his past, but he also finds no promise of a future. He's lost self-empathy, backward-looking and forward-looking, and what he has instead are fixed and truthful feelings, images of himself that are absolutely intolerable and unbearable. And that's what causes suicide. And we, know we might say this, after all, is a kind of empathy. It's empathy, a horrible kind of empathy. He feels far too much of, of himself. He has far too much access, all too vividly. But he does so, and it's critical, without any compassion, without any mercy, without mourning for a crazed self, where mourning leaves room for hope. So I hope I've sort of um, given us a little look at the moral injuries that soldiers um, internalize in these external battlefield examples that we've been puzzling over these, um, of these, uh, these days. And I think part of it is um, they are not at all callous, at least almost to the person, those that I've spoken to. They routinely impose moral responsibility on themselves in the face of circumstances that mock their own agency, that make it hard to understand their own agency, whether flukish brute luck, the tyranny of bureaucracy, public indifference, gappy intelligence, or all to misfiring and lethal high-tech, low-tech weaponry. Moral luck, luck morally injures, and it begs for healing, in part through the consolations of self-empathy that allow for the ownership of the past and some trust and hope in the goodness of oneself in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>